Hi, Robert. Hello. Um, first things first, Toyota Prius, is it still okay? The Mark III. The, the yes. new one. The new one, yes, yes. very good, yes. 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 Um, have you caught up with Jeremy Clarkson yet? And would you get him in carpool? Oh, definitely, uh, yeah, yes. he, he would do it. I don't know if he would, he, he lives quite near me. Um, we have exchanged opinions <laughs> in the past. <laughs> I can't repeat them here. Even with my foul mouth, that he can go a little bit further. Um, his main gripe, because we, there was a weird connection to us because the camera crew on Scrappy, about 50% of them, all were also the camera crew on Top Gear. So there was all this messaging via cameramen, which is a very peculiar way. You know, some people use Twitter, some people use text. I used cameramen. Which I used most of the yeah. And they, they fantastic messages, because they, they like, I'd get there early on a Wednesday morning, and they go, like, oh, Robert, Jeremy's got a message for you. And I go, oh, you know, oh, really, what did he say? <laughs> he just torrents of foul invective would come out of their mouth. I think um, it would be an interesting interview between the two of you. It would be great fun, wouldn't it? No, he's, he's a, I think he's a genius, funny guy. He's a very funny guy. I don't know if he would do it. Who knows, contractually, whether he'd be allowed or whether he'd punch me out or whatever. <laughs> it would be great fun. Because he's a big fella. He's very big. Because he asked me what... He does do that. I met him one of the first time I met him. He just... You know, I was introduced to him and I went, Oh, hello! You know, because he's up there, you know. And I, he said, What do you drive? Straight away. And I laughed and I said, You can't really be serious, don't you? Surely you don't really ask that. Not a smile. What do you drive? <laughs> so I did tell So I said, I, I thought, kind of, a bit of think about this game. So I said, The Land Rover, because I haven't got an old Land Rover. Good car. And then he immediately said, Has it got, I can't, I'm just trying to filter out the filthy language, has it got large, chunky American tyres that only a man who self abuses himself regularly would put off? <laughs> And I, and I had to admit that it did. <laughs> and then he implied that I was only, I was, a, I was, I was a, 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 a part of a woman's reproductive system. <laughs> <laughs> only a total part of a woman's reproductive system would do such a thing. But then he heard through the cameraman that I traded in a rechipped, uh, modified R32 Golf, which is the fastest Golf ever made, and it was rechipped by a German engineer that's made my brother, so it, was a, it would do 165 miles an hour, and it had done that on the Top Gear track. I'd driven it around the track, but not when they were filming and not on Top Gear, but we were filming in the same place. And um, he heard that I traded that car in for a Prius. So I'd gone from his all-time favourite hot hatchback that he raves about and thinks is a car, it is a bloody amazing car, to the, you know, the car that can only be described as a, a, a personal offence against him. <laughs> Which is one of the main reasons I got it. <laughs> you have to take it in that car. Uh, I just get very, I got very moody with them. I mean, because I, I am a genuine fan of Top Gear. I think it is a genius show. I think those three guys are irreplaceable. I mean, every other combination they try to do internationally when they've done Top Gear Australia, Top Gear America, hasn't quite worked. They are amazing at it. But they did do a review of a car that I was involved with, a Tesla, a, a, an electric sports car. And they reviewed this car, and I knew they would tear it to bits, because they have to, because it's not got an engine that goes vroom! You know, so it's got to be a lady or a gay car. <laughs> For those of you, uh, the one thing I really want you to watch, if you get the chance, is to watch a man called uh, Rich Tuckwell who writes a column, uh, he writes for a lot of gay magazines. He's an extraordinarily gay man, and he runs a website called Top Gayer. <laughs> <laughs> and he will tell you which, what is a gay car and what isn't, and the Prius is not a gay car. A gay man would not be seen dead in the Prius. Just, they're not trivial. But anyway, um, uh, they, so they did a review of this car on Top Gear, where, which is this very high-speed electric car, and. Jeremy Clarkson, obviously at the beginning, genuinely impressed with it, said it was amazing, oh my god, uh, you know, I've only ever driven dial-up before, this is broadband. See, he comes up at nights like that, brilliant. Um, because it's faster than most petrol cars, this guy, it is an extraordinary thing to drive. And then they did, they set up this whole sequence where it ran out of batteries after 55 miles and they had to push it back into the garage. And then they had to reveal later, in an interview with the producer, that it hadn't run out of batteries. But they were showing the viewer what would happen if it did run out of batteries. In just the way, the same way they show you what happens in a Lamborghini when that runs out of petrol. Have we ever seen that on Top Gear? No, we haven't, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so I got a bit shirty about that because I know the people from Tesla. They were there, the guy who was there with the car from Tesla 
got in the car immediately after they said it had run out of batteries and turned it on and drove it around the track three times and went, no, it's all right, <laughs> it's fine. And it hadn't done that. So they lied. And the fact that the Top Gear organisation outside the BBC is sponsored by Shell has got nothing to do with it. <laughs> nothing whatsoever. Take any notice of that at all. <laughs> So that's right. the brand <laughs> There's a well you, you want to work around there's a gentleman back there. This is well, I don't know how I barely mentioned red dwarfs. Talk about bloody electric cars. Right. But you yeah, can get another bell. Um your OT to I two movie that you do, you got yeah. any more plans to do any kind of stuff like that? It's a, I mean I'm basically I'm experimenting with new media. Yeah, that, yeah. which is a mugs game. Uh, new media means you do what you used to do and get paid for it, but you do it for nothing. Uh, so it was a, a brave experiment that didn't quite work. It wasn't a disaster. Well, I mean, it. Oh, did you? No, thank you. I'm hugely <laughs> grateful to the people who bought it, and because uh, it, it was done on as effectively a zero budget. Yeah. So, so um, it was done well, though. For the thank you. That's very kind of you. Moment. Especially, like, I mean, pretty much just you. Like, the only other film I've seen, it was like that, phone booth. And people actually go, oh god, it's just him all the way through, but you know, you're yeah. really good. Oh, thank you. No, well, I mean, I mean, it's, it, it's, I mean, it's also the distribution of stuff. I mean, that's yeah. what Carpool has proved. Carpool has just had its, couple of, well, it's two weeks ago now, its millionth download on iTunes, which is, okay. considering it's got no PR and, you know, nothing behind it, is bloody remarkable. I mean, I'm really amazed. And that's a clearly a better model for distributing something, and much cheaper than DVDs. I mean, yeah. well, so, you, your movies, they are available on the... Like little film and things like that, if anybody's on those kind of subscriptions, they can just rent it. So. Can they? Oh, that's why I saw it first, yeah, and I bought it. So. I didn't even know. Because they bought a big. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all meant. Because they bought a load of. They thought they were coasters. Because they got them cheap. Sad. They got a bulk order. I mean, like 10, you know, not like 10,000. <laughs> They've got a few of them. Oh, really? So you could rent it off Love Yeah, Hall. yeah. You're kidding. I wish I'd known that. I'm going to Twitter it. You still can. <laughs> right, I'm Twittering it straight away. Richard Hawkins told you that. You can put that on Twitter as well, please. The what, sorry? Richard Hawkins informed you of that. Can you put that on Twitter? <laughs> yes. I will. God, that stuff you, The stuff you find out these days with these young folks. <laughs> They're marvellous, they're very interconnected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well. Why not? You're there. Hi. Hello. Um, how did you get the part of Crichton or Red Wolf? I got the part uh, more or less against my better judgement. <laughs> so I think I said no initially. Uh, I wrote a play in 1988 called Mammon, Robot Born of Woman which doesn't make any sense, but what it, what it was was about a, a, a female scientist that made a, a robo-yuppie. Uh, so you know, yuppies were a big, a big thing at the time, you know, um, ludicrous guys walking around with big folks who since made loads of money and then lost all our money. The same tossers. Uh, <laughs> so it was a critique of modern capitalism at the height of Thatcherism in 1988, and it was, uh, so she made a robot that would be the perfect money-making tool to go into the marketplace and be a pushy, heterosexual white man, except he wasn't sexual. So then she made some software that would make him a more sexually aware creature, and then of course he goes wrong. So, we, so she's kind of building the perfect man, and then it all goes wrong. So it was a comedy about masculinity and capitalism and blah, blah, blah. That's making it sound quite highbrow. It wasn't, it was a dirty, cheap comedy. I copulated to the desk right across the stage, you know, there's lots of cheap acts. But in that, there were some <laughs> rubbish robots um, that were her early examples who didn't do very good walking and had, one of them had a sort of what I classified as a Canadian accent. So he would come on. It wasn't quite Crichton, but it was, I am not functioning properly. You know, it's that kind of nonsense. So, and Paul Jackson, who was then the producer of Red Dwarf, saw that show. It was a bit one prize and it did very well. And said, do you want to do... do you, he rang me up and said, do you want to be in Red Dwarf? And I'd seen Red Dwarf. I knew about it. I knew Norman loved it very well. But... I'd just been commissioned to write that play as a six-part series for Channel 4, which was my ambition. I didn't want to be in it, I wanted to write it. And be, I wanted to be Doug later. <laughs> but then eventually, Paul Jackson bullied me to go and so I basically said no to start with, which I can't believe now, looking back. But then, because I, I didn't want to be... <laughs> that I, it's, it is a cruel admission, but I went in to see Rob and Doug, and I said, I'm worried about it because I don't want to be typecast as a robot. <laughs> I tried to play about a robot and they wanted me to play with it. But I thought they meant 
you know, Crichton. I hadn't seen the episode with Crichton in it, so I didn't know what it meant. I thought it would be like a Robocop helmet, so that you take it off and then have lunch. <laughs> I didn't know quite what it was when I agreed to do it. But Rob and Doug were such amazing guys to me, I got on with them so well that uh, I kind of got sucked in. So that's essentially how I got involved in it. So, um, yes, that's it. And then once they'd stuck the rubber on me, it was too late. <laughs> <laughs>